Okay, welcome everyone to the 2020 webinar series. Our webinar today, Equipping Students for STEM Careers Through Industrial Projects, the MAA PIC Math Program. Our presenters today are Vinod Chelamuthu and Jennifer Travis. They will introduce themselves in a few minutes. Uh, this webinar is co-sponsored by the Mathematical Association of America. Any views expressed by the presenters are not necessarily the views of AMATIC and any commercial products they mentioned are not endorsed by AMATIC. Uh, McGraw-Hill Higher Education is the sponsor for the 2020 AMATIC webinar series. Okay, so uh, Vinod, I'm going to stop sharing now and I will turn it over to the two of you. Okay, thank you, Pat. Okay, well, hi everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us for this webinar. I am Jennifer Travis and I'm here with my colleague Vinod Chalamuthu. Vinod and I have had the opportunity to work with students on industry projects um, and we've seen that these projects can be extremely valuable and even transformative for our students. We both got started on this through the MAA PICMATH program. That's the Mathematical Association of America. And today we would like to share with you how we implemented these projects at our institutions and let you know a little bit more about PicMath in case it's something you want to get started with yourself. So I am at Lone Star College, which is a large community college in Houston, Texas. So big college, big city. We have six large campuses and a bunch of smaller campuses. Um, my Lone Star College North Harris campus is one of the larger ones. It's um, the most racially diverse of our campuses and it's in an economically disadvantaged area. I would say that um, Lone Star College is pretty typical as of most community colleges in terms of the programs that we offer and the types of students that we have. Hi, I'm Vinod Chalamutu. I'm a Dixie State University. Dixie State University is a four-year university. It shares lots of characteristics with community colleges. It is an open access and associate degree granting institution. Dixie State currently has approximately around 12,000 students, and uh, it is committed to providing students with active applied learning, and our motto is active learning, active life. And to give a brief, brief background about us, uh, I did my master's and a PhD in mathematics. Uh, I have experience in working on applied research projects through my graduate work and also I have quite a bit of experience on mentoring undergraduates on the research projects. Me on the other hand, I did not do mathematical research in grad school. I didn't even do a thesis for my master's and so I don't have any formal training in applied mathematics and really no experience with mathematical modeling beyond what we teach in our community college classes. I eventually got a PhD, but it was in math education, not mathematics. So I did get some statistical and data analysis knowledge from that, but I'm far from an expert. Vinod's background with his PhD in math is more typical for PIC math faculty, since so many of them are at four-year universities. Uh, my background is, I think, pretty typical for a lot of community college math faculty. Just a little introduction on what is PICMATH. Uh, PICMATH stands for Preparation for Industrial Careers in Mathematical Sciences. And uh, this program provides an opportunity to faculty to teach a class which prepares students for industrial careers by engaging them in real world problems coming directly from business, uh, industry, and government agencies, which includes nonprofit organization. More importantly, the PICMATH class actually provides an opportunity for students to build skills that needed to be competent in today's job market. And our training and support to the faculties is provided by MA PICMATH program. And uh, the PICMATH program is funded by National Science Foundation and the National Security Agency. So when we ask why is PICMATH valuable for students? Think about it. Most of the times students are not given opportunity to work in teams coming from different disciplines. Moreover, no one, no job is gonna ask, okay, solve problem number five. Problem number five on chapter five, I'll give you $5,000. It is more like, okay, hey, here is a problem, go and fix it. The team is here, the diverse background. So actually employers are looking for students 
not to solve a problem from textbook, more like they want graduates who can use the skills they learned in the classroom to solve the actual problem on complex, messy problem in the real world. This actually, this program actually allows students to get hands-on experience and introduce them to more career possibilities. More importantly, this opportunity provides them with professional skills needed in today's job market, like teamwork, presentation skills, writing skills, and set essential, like to be successful in their first job. For this webinar today, we would like to focus less on actual projects and more on how the class worked. How you can go about doing a class like this at your university or college. For more on why pick math is valuable, please watch uh, Michael's and Shuzi's Amatic webinar from last year. The link is provided below. So here's a little more information about pick math. Pick math started in 2014, and there have been five cohorts of pick math faculty so far. I was in the most recent cohort, which means I finished teaching the class this past spring. Vinod was in the previous cohort, so he taught the class for the first time in spring of 2019. My cohort had four community college faculty, which is four times more than they had in any previous year. The pick math organizers would really like to see more participation from community college faculty, which would open up this learning experience to a whole different set of students. The, um, I definitely advise you to visit the pick math website to get more information. There's a list of prior pick math faculty and their colleges and their projects. Keep in mind, and this is not obvious, for each of the faculty members there, the only one industry partner and one project is listed. But most of those faculty had multiple teams and a lot of them worked with more than one industry partner, but only one for each makes it onto the pick math website. It'll still give you a real good flavor of what's been done in the past. So um, if and we'll go into more detail on this later, but if you decide to do pick math, these are basically the steps you would have to do. In fact, these are the major tasks you would have to do to do a class like this, even if you um, even if it wasn't affiliated with pick math, you would still have to get your college to offer the class. Then you'd need to line up the partner organizations and the projects and get the data. You'd have to recruit the students and teach the class. Vinod has taught this class a couple of times in the fall when it wasn't officially part of pick math and he still had to do all, go through all this process. Um, by the way, the pick math program for the current academic year got postponed because of the pandemic. So there aren't going to be any official pick math classes during the spring of 2021. Although of course this college still could offer a class like this if they wanted. I think this would have been a really difficult year for a faculty member to do a class like this for the first time. So now that I've done it, I see that a class like this is possible even without the pick math program. You just have to sell the idea to your college and do it. But pick math helped a lot. It helped my college see that I wasn't crazy and that this actually could be done. It had been done successfully elsewhere at other colleges. And this also gave us some credibility with the companies that we were suggesting partnering with. And it probably helped with potential students also. I have found the pick math organizers to be super supportive. That includes Michael and Susie, who did the webinar last year um, for AMATIC. As a community college faculty member, they're aware that I have a different set of challenges than perhaps those at four-year institutions. I've modified some things to make it work for our institution and our students, and they've been fine with that. And actually, even at four-year institutions, there's huge differences, and um, they really want everybody to make it work for them so that it can be successful wherever they are. The support network um, from pick math is really valuable if you take advantage of it. If you can find even one or two fellow pick math faculty and exchange ideas and documents with them, that's a big help. Last year, Vinod and I met up at the AMATIC conference and I spent about two hours picking his brain about everything he did in his class, what he, um, what he would do again, what he wouldn't do again, what advice he had for me. And that was a huge help. Next, we would like to share some experiences on how we structured the class on those things and how to start with pick math programs. 
So part of the PIC math, once I got accepted, I designed a new class, uh, Math 4800. It's called Industrial Careers in Mathematics at my university as a PIC math class during spring 2019 semester. In order to register for this class, the students asked to require instructor's, per instructor's permission because it is also good for them to ask questions about this class and what is the uh, what is the com time commitment, all those things. So it was a great timing, by the way, because uh, my department is actually looking for more active learning courses uh, because our university motto is active learning, active life. So we would like to get more active learning courses within the curriculum and on training. So, and also this course is counted towards a degree plan for several STEM majors, including mathematics majors and minors. And it acted as an applied learning project class for a new degree program, uh, Bachelor of Science in Applied and Computational Mathematics. And also, uh, I taught this course for past four semesters, including this fall 2020 semester. Uh, spring 2019 and spring 2020 are the official PIC math courses. My university allowed me to offer this course during the fall semester uh, because they know the value and opportunity it provided for the students, which was amazing. I had students from all disciplines. Uh, you can easily see uh, there are math majors, engineering majors, computer science, and finance majors into that program. And uh, I strongly believe the greatest strength of this course is the diverse background of students I had. And I publicized uh, to recruit more students to the program uh, by presenting it to the, my linear algebra class on what is the value and what type of opportunity this course could provide. And I also distributed flyers through Math Club and STEM Club. So some of the sample problems uh, I worked with my students uh, through this PIC math program are one of the problem is from parks data. Uh, parks data collaborates with uh, Zion National Park and the parks data provided a sample data set of Zion National Park entrance activity. The goal was to develop an algorithm to predict the number of hikers on specific trials based on park entrance data. More, more specifically, they're looking for the Zion, or Zion National Park administration is looking for uh, allocate resources more eff effectively and uh, improve visitors' experience. Currently, at present, there is no, nothing like park goers or employees have no method to determine how busy a particular hiking trial will be on the given day and time. This will actually, you know, what one of the students are working on this project that results or whatever software, whatever. Uh, uh, some algorithm they are going to uh, develop that will help Zion National Park administration to allocate resources more effectively and improve the visitors' experience. And another sample problem my students worked on was from Redcliffe Lab. Redcliffe Lab is a local company that provided us auto transmission company uh, customer data for years to better understand their market and customer needs. They have learned that certain leads have a much higher potential of becoming valuable paying clients based on several data points. They would like to capitalize on the knowledge by putting extra marketing and lead follow-up efforts throughout towards their 20% of the prospects. To do this, uh, they would like students to develop a system or a tool which can provide real-time probabilities of customers. Actually, our students created a software uh, using like a SQL a front end, which, take da which took data such as gender, age, make, model, and mileage of a car. And the uh, system, the software, spits out a likelihood of the customer using the service in future or purchasing a transmission thing. I also would like to point out something in the picture here. And uh, there are three students here. There's a real diverse group of students. Uh, one is a computer science major, and one is a finance major, and one is a math major. That's exactly the strength, I would say, because everyone has their strength. They can contribute to the solution of one common solution to the complex and messy problem. Another problem I would like to say is uh, it's a local uh, mosquito abatement center. It's called uh, Southwest Mosquito Abatement and Control uh, District, uh, which is responsible for controlling mosquito population. Uh, within the Washington County uh, in St. George, Utah. And the goal is to develop a mosquito abatement strategies to control mosquito population within Southwest Utah. And uh, the, moreover, to find correlation between the treatment effectiveness and the number of mosquitoes trapped. 
because in this way they can actually optimize their resources and uh, how, how they can utilize this actually whatever the students created the algorithm that is valuable information for the southwest mosquito abatement center on how to utilize resources more effectively so at my college we offered the class through honors it was a standalone honor seminar. It wasn't associated with a particular course. So in that sense, it's different from honors history or honors calculus one. The students got credit for four honors research hours toward their um, honors designation on their associate degree. It did not count toward anyone's degree plan. My department chair tried really hard to get this to count. He went through all the learning outcomes for all our courses, um, came to me really excited and said, hey, you're, you guys are gonna meet almost all the official learning outcomes for math for liberal arts. And I was like, great, math for liberal arts is not on the degree plan for any STEM major. And we're like, oh, okay, so that didn't help. So it didn't count. Um, we've proposed, we would love to add a special problems course to our course catalog um, that would give us more flexibility. Um, and we haven't been successful in that, but we haven't, it hasn't been ruled out either. And that could be used for other purposes, like maybe somebody from some campus wants to do a math history independent study. We would like to see that happen, but it worked pretty well going through honors. I think figuring out how the course will count is a bigger challenge for those of us at community colleges than for those at universities. Universities usually already have a special problems or special topics course. They also have electives and capstones that the seniors have to take. Um, one of the, we don't have that. We have associate degree programs. One of my um, fellow PIC math faculty who's at a community college in my cohort, she got it to count as the capstone for a new data science program that she started at her college. There are more and more community colleges that are starting data science associate and certificate programs. And so if your college is doing something like that, this class could fit very, very nicely with that. So um, once the class is set up, you have to give thought to recruiting the students and getting the word out about the class so that they'll want to take it. Um, we, me and our honors director, we put on a question and answer session that students could come to. Um, we also created an application with some open-ended questions. I, uh, we publicized it through honors. I also asked some colleagues who are teaching um, Calculus to recommend good students. I only asked a limited number of colleagues because I was worried about getting too many interested students. Um, and, and so about half of my students were already in honors and the other half joined honors just so that they could take the class. And so those students just saw the value in this, having an experience like that. This, they weren't really originally after an honors designation or anything. So they took it that, that way. At the PIC math workshop, it was suggested that there should be a minimum math requirement. Um, a couple of suggestions that were made is everybody should have a programmer on every team and there should be uh, some advanced math and a minimum math requirement, probably calculus. None of that was realistic for us. We had very little programming. If I had made calculus a minimum requirement, my class would have been half the size and some really some students would have missed out on a really valuable experience. So I'm glad I didn't make that a minimum requirement. I think that um, That the most important characteristics for being successful in this class are their work ethic, their attention to detail and their willingness to take initiative and in learning things they've never seen before. So those are a lot more important than how much math they've had. Programming skill would have been great. If, if you can get that, I'm all in favor of that. It would have helped a lot. So problems are our students tackled and I will apologize in advance for not having any photos. And so this is just an illustration of the challenges that you have when you do this. PR, is something that I totally ended up not being good at. I started out okay on that. And in fact, I got the PR guys to interview a couple of my students at the beginning of the semester. And then once all the have to stuff got in, it always slipped. And, um, and in fact, when we, I forgot to take pictures whenever we had the opportunity. So, um, but the Houston Astros was one of our projects. So 
The Astros provided us with a data set that had in information about different fan promotions that all the different Major League Baseball teams offer at their home games. So the teams often will give away bobbleheads or t-shirts or other items as the fans go into the stadium. They'll also have Dollar Hot Dog Day or Kids Run the Bases or other promotions. And so we had that data. The data set covered all of Major League Baseball and we had a lot of other variables about each games. So we had, I guess there were like 2,400 games in the data set. So then we had a second corporate partner, Crown Beverage Packaging. Crown Beverage Packaging is a huge international company, but this turned out to be a local project. Crown has a plant in Conroe, Texas, which is about 30 minutes from our campus. They make aluminum cans for soda and beer and such. The plant manager provided us with six months of data about their can spoilage. That was, those are cans that can't be sold for whatever reason. They're discarded along the way, somewhere in the production process. The data was broken down by the different parts of the plant and the stages of the production process. So we got to learn a lot about can manufacturing, which is really cool. And of course, when we went to the plant and got a tour, I forgot to take the photo. So I, I had four student teams. Uh, my original goal was four teams of four, and I'm so glad I didn't. And so four teams of three, I think would be much better. I had 11 students. And um, so one of this, I originally had 12, but one student bailed after the day one of class. So I basically had 11 the whole time. So that gave me one two person team. They panicked at first when they lost their teammate, like, oh no, will we be at a disadvantage? It did not turn out to be that way at all. Actually, they did very well and they were just fine. And in some ways it actually ended up being an advantage from a coordination standpoint. So I thought that worked actually really well to have two teams on each project, a little bit of healthy competition and collaboration. Um, the format timeline, I was trying to think of things that would make this as much of a positive for the students for their career and their growth as possible. I arranged with our um, organizational development folks who do workshops for faculty and staff to come and do a Clifton Strengths workshop for our students. And so the students took the, um, the strengths inventory and I actually used that a little bit when I put them into teams. So we did that at the beginning. We took a tour of the plant, the students who were working on that project. Um, on Vinod's advice, I met with them individually every other week through the beginning and we would alternate weeks to um, they did presentations basically every other week and met with me um, individually every other week and a lot of those turned into just like how can i help you get involved in this project and what might we do next and um, we were gonna do a presentation for the corporate partner right before spring break it got postponed till right after and then we never came back so they ended up doing their presentation for the corporate partner in june our semester got extended because of the pandemic till late May, and then my students took longer. They did their presentations in June and they did get their reports finished in July. I think I mentioned on an earlier slide that our class was pass, no pass. It was a seminar, so it wasn't like I could just give them a bad grade and say, hey, you're, you're done. So they needed to get it done um, to a level that was A-level a work. Tools I used, um, I made them do all their reports in LaTeX, which, um, and also their slides. It can be a little intimidating at first, but Overleaf, which is a cloud sharing platform that worked really well. Um, we use the free version. I set them up in Data Camp to learn coding. We use that a little at the beginning, not a lot. We use Jupyter Notebooks with Python for all of our plots and analysis. Um, that lets you write the code cell by cell and run it cell by cell. So you can arrange everything linearly and um, that worked really well. Um, I was pleased with that tool. I would use that again. So yeah, on my experiences, I would like to add some more things in addition to Jennifer's thoughts. I generally do a survey before the start of a semester, giving them a list of skills such as uh, mathematical maturity level based on the courses they have taken and uh, programming skills and presentation skills and return skills, writing skills. On the range of level to choose from one to 10, uh, based on the responses uh, I receive, uh, I would try to put together a student teams complementing the skill set because it is very important uh, to have at least like a one uh, person who has a little bit of background program programming so they can implement algorithms, those kind of things. Uh, but you know, uh, more than more than anything, any any skill set, I would strongly say that motivation is very important. That that is very important. 
And uh, also I noticed that we got to keep them on track. So to do that, at the end of every class, each group should have a put in writing what they want to have accomplished by the next class with each student member committing to what they want to get, at, get done. Because without that, without the to-do list for next class, if they leave the class, they're not gonna get things done. We all know about our students. It, 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 this class is not that kind of class where you can actually skip a week and you can come back. It is, it is a class where you gotta keep everything on track because it, it has lots of teamwork to it. And it is important to schedule meetings with industrial sponsors in advance as they are very busy with their own jobs because before the semester, I try to make an appointment with the industrial sponsors and say, hey, uh, this is a midway through the semester. Can you come to the class and talk to the students? And uh, can, can, can you listen to the presentation, give feedback? At the same time, it would be very beneficial for students to receive feedback on their solution strategy so that they can improve on the algorithm or whatever route they're going, is it a right track or not? Another thing very important for me is I, 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 I did meet with individual students bi-weekly in my office because that helps both the student and myself keeping us on track. Uh, I also require students to meet outside the class to work and discuss on the problem and work towards one common solution. And when they come to class, they can easily report to me. I always prepare my students like saying, hey, if I come to you a group and ask for a five minute report, they should be able to report to me in five minutes what they've done for the past two weeks or one week. So they should be able to do that. So one of the more intimidating parts of being in pick math is having to line up the industrial partners, especially like I've never approached anybody at companies. How do I do that? So um, take advantage of resources at your institution. Both of my leads came from the Lone Star College Foundation, which is the wing of Lone Star College that brings in donations for scholarships and such. So in September, I had a phone meeting with the director of the foundation and one of her program managers. And I told them about pick math and the class and hey, can you um, do get in touch with some of your industry contacts and see if they would be interested in working with us on this. And they were excited about this because they're like, this is going to be great. We get to approach funnies, companies and ask them for something other than money. Um, so they don't run away. And um, they asked me to create like an executive summary that was written that they could send to the companies. And so I did that and that was very effective. And then I was able to modify that into a recruiting document for the students. So those two documents actually look very similar. Um, at the end of the conversation, the director of the foundation asked me um, a question I wasn't prepared for. She asked me, who is your dream partner? And I mumbled and fumbled and I was like, I, I have no idea. And then I said, the Houston Astros, because I was a big Astros fan and we were, they were in the middle of a playoff run. And I said, but just kidding, that would never happen. My real dream partner is a local company that is in an industry that students wouldn't be exposed to otherwise. Um, a, an industry that hires STEM majors, especially if that industry hires summer, summer interns. And um, someplace that would be really supportive of our students and maybe invite them to see their facility and help them with their resumes and so on. So as it turns out, I ended up with both my dream partners, which was really cool because Cron fit the bill for that um, completely. Also in that process, I did use my personal network and I um, had tentatively lined up with a large nonprofit in our area who was very excited about working with us, but he was still working on trying to get the data and then that took a while and then, Finally, um, the data ended up not coming through, but I ha did talk to him after the class started. And, um, and as far as I know, he's still interested in working with us again in the future. Yeah, for me, after I got accepted into the PIC Math program in uh, spring 2018, I believe, yeah, spring 2018, uh, then uh, I was looking for uh, uh, industrial collaborations in the local community to prepare a problem for spring 2019 during the fall uh, 2018, 2018 semester. And uh, it was that time I, I had a chance because our College of Science and Engineering and Technology Dean is very active with the local business community. So I made an appointment with him and then he was amazing. So he guided and helped me to find local partners for the spring 2019 semester. Actually that made me realize how many businesses around the community are willing to collaborate and eager to work with students and help them to reach their potential. 
So it would be really nice. I, this is what advice I should say is, it would be really always nice to start the conversation with administration. In that way, you can take advantage of the existing collaboration. Because think about it, for Jennifer, she actually got it, got, she did that. She went to Lone Star College Foundation and then the, she didn't reinvent the wheel. So she got that existing collaboration. She took the advantage of that. So I would strongly recommend you guys to start with your administration because there is all, always some existing collaboration happening with the community. And after spring 2019 semester, it was very easy for me to spread the news around the campus and the community because students have been talking about the scores and faculties know there is a real world problem solving class. So uh, the local industries actually contacted me uh, asking for, hey, is there, a, is, there a pos is there a possibility of collaborating? Uh, we have a data set here. Is, it, is there a way the students can work on this problem? Something like that. So it, it was very, very fruitful collaboration what I had after spring 2019. So when I want to talk about the challenges, absolutely. Yeah, when you want to do something outside the box, definitely there will be challenges, right? So the first challenge I would say is collaborating with multiple stakeholders. Uh, that includes department faculty and uh, administration and the industrial sponsors. For example, that is a time our entire department is trying to uh, revamp the courses, uh, saying, okay, what type of active learning strategies we can include in the courses. So I want to make sure that, okay, this course fits into the long-term goals of the department. And so I, it's not about just me getting, getting excited. I want everybody else to be, who is going to be involved to get excited. So we did that. Uh, that, was one, that was a challenge. And another challenge was, as I told you, Dixie State University shares so many things, common traits of community colleges, right? So I, too, add the mixed levels of maturity level. There is a student who has linear algebra. There was a student who multivariable calculus. There was a differential equation student. With all those students, there is multiple levels of maturity level here. So it was very difficult to put together a team uh, with the right balance. So that was the thing. And this is another thing I want to tell you. So mitigating the fear of real world problem solving. After every semester I have seen, after the first two weeks, they come to my office, at least two, two, two students come to my office and say, we well, you know, this course is not for me. You know what? Because I understand, because all other courses are just like going to lecture, understanding the things, and coming back, doing homework problems, and submitting it. So they, they, never thought, they never thought about, okay, hey, there is a real world complex and messy problem. Can I use the knowledge to solve it? So that is always there. That is always, every time there. So you got to be prepared to get them excited and motivated. That is a challenge. And also keeping the students on task. You should understand, if you don't keep them on task, they will not get the things done within a semester. This is a semester course. They have to get whatever the solution. They're gonna find your solution, not the solution. Whatever they got, that's what it is. So I'm receiving feedback from industrial sponsors because as I mentioned previously, you need to make an appointment and make the schedule very clear before the semester starts so that the students are not slacking and uh, so they can get easy feedbacks. And another thing I wanna say is, students are not taking just this one class. They are taking multiple classes. So there are students who want to spend more time on other classes too. You should understand they're not taking this only class. And I also see in the reverse way because I have seen some students who want to spend more time on this because they like this type of things and they slack on other courses. So I, I, I try to tell them, hey, no, you got to get good grades on those courses too. So you got to make sure that that is happening. So for me, before the class started, so like the fall before, um, big challenges were getting the class created and built and our enrollment system was more challenging than I expected. Everyone who needed to be on board was on board with the class, but there were just delays and the students um, didn't actually get enrolled until finals week and the students were starting to get nervous about whether this class was really gonna happen. Um, I think that's just because it was new and we had a key person out unexpectedly. I'm sure that would be better the next time. The most stressful part on that, I would say, is trying to figure out for sure the students to invite, because I didn't know how many more were going to apply, and getting the balance right with the students and the projects, because I didn't have the projects nailed down 
until after the students had to be recruited. I didn't want to get a bunch of students and not have projects for them, but I also didn't want to commit to the companies and then end up not being able to recruit enough students. And I was still a little bit torn about whether there should be a minimum math requirement. So I was hesitant, should I let this first semester student in? And I ended up doing so, but at the beginning I wasn't sure. So it was just, will it all come together and actually happen? Now, once the class started, the, um, the biggies were um, knowledge and time for me. So, and actually for both me and the students. So not enough knowledge, not enough time. So um, the other stuff, managing the teams and keeping the students on task, like, yeah, those were challenges, but to me, they were not as large. So I felt like I had no idea what I was doing on the data analysis. So that means both conceptually and mechanically, I was not sure what sort of approach to suggest to the students for modeling anything, and I didn't know how to code it. Um, I knew this wasn't a lecture-based class and, um, and that these weren't cookie cutter problems and that I wasn't supposed to speak, spoon fed them the answers, but still there's a limit to where you can realistically expect the students, if they start with this level of knowledge, where they can get to in a semester um, in that specific amount of time, even if they're really stretching themselves. So I think the students would have benefited from um, more guidance than I had the knowledge to provide. So, but that said, I sure know a whole lot more than I did then. Um, so part of that was um, one of the data sets wasn't in a great format for the students to work with. In fact, I couldn't share it with them the way it was and I had to extract it and that involved using programs I had never touched before. Um, so and then time. I had really too many things on my plate both before and after we shut down for the pandemic. And in some ways the pandemic saved my class because I had just as my, many responsibilities or maybe even more, but I had more flexibility on how to arrange them. And so I actually could put those, allocate the time to visit with the students and work through their reports with them and then help them figure out how to do the analysis and the coding. Um, and it also, I guess, made it a little more acceptable that the students didn't finish in time. Um, so I know that wasn't ideal, but um, Considering the circumstances, I did feel like that was the best decision for my students to let them go a little bit longer. So those were my biggest challenges. So rewards, the biggest reward was just seeing them grow and learn and sort of become the experts on their data. So um, the, the, they grew in knowledge and confidence the whole time. Um, I, the day of the first presentation, so I think like three weeks into the class, um, one of my teams didn't show up and I didn't know where they were. I didn't have their cell numbers yet. Turns out they were in the library tweaking their slides and somebody introduced an error and the slides wouldn't compile and they panicked and they just frantically tried to fix it instead of coming and telling me. And so, of course, we had a discussion about how they should have handled it and they realized I was not going to beat them up for not being LaTeX experts after three weeks. Um, and so then at the end, when they gave their presentation for the corporate liaison, I was just bursting with pride because they were nervous, but they got through it and they went through and did their whole presentation and they did a really good job. So that was neat. Um, especially the second half of the class, as they um, started to really get somewhere on the analysis, it was, they started to feel more like collaborators instead of students. And that was really neat. Um, it took me a while to realize, but it reminded me of when I was doing my dissertation and I would meet with my advisor every week and I would bring sections of my draft and we would argue about how to analyze the data or how we should define this variable. And, um, and then I realized that's kind of what I'm doing with my students. And it was really neat to have that level of interaction with them. One big thing, and this applies both to me and the students, you have to embrace the risk of failure. I had to do with that with this class and so did the students. Once I committed, I was risking um, not being able to get the projects or that something would fall through for some reason. Um, if you want to grow, you have to work hard and being willing to risk your ego. And so that is the, that's something I wanted my students to learn. And so I tried to model that for them. And, um, and then I would talk to them about that when they would come to me and say, hey, I want to drop the class. Um, so we would have those conversations. One big reward I hope to get eventually would be if this turned into a long-term plus for my campus 
something that draws students in and makes them want to come here and be excited about coming here. And Vinod has done that at his campus. And, um, and so that's kind of what I aspire to. So for me, the biggest rewards are like, there's lots of, lots of rewards I got to pick math program. The pick math program actually changed my perspective of teaching and improved my pedagogy. And uh, actually, I, I really looked at my classes differently after I got an opportunity to teach pick math. And uh, very importantly, I clearly witnessed the growth mindset of my students. They all went through frustrating moments, no doubt in it. But however, I felt they didn't go through the moments, they actually grown through those moments. So that was amazing. So also I could say I could support the uh, factors of uh, uh, the active learning and active life motto of my university uh, through this courses and it opened up so many other opportunities throughout the campus. So everything is happening in silo within different departments. So this course actually opened up for me to collaborate with different departments. Okay, hey, here is a project, here is a project, different project. Can we connect these two projects through this process of pick math? So that's what it is. So it all happened very good in that way. And more importantly, small curriculum changes such as this class can lead to big innovations. One thing is uh, this opportunity provided me to create a certificate in modeling and simulation uh, within my department uh, that is offered right now to the students. And also uh, there is a new center we established called Analytics and Modeling Center, which is a collaboration between the College of Business and the uh, math Mathematics Department where the analytics and uh, analytics hub, data analytics hub is part of business college and the modeling and simulation hub is part of math department. So what we're doing right now is we're getting a problem from the local community and then we are putting together students from math department and the business department and probably computer science students together a team and trying to, students are trying to solve the local problems. So which was, which was a great thing and it is a pick math model uh, without pick math, I don't think that model would have existed. So that was good. So to say something about rewards for the students, uh, one thing I want to say is, think about it. All most of the students, when they go for after they finish the pick math, they come to me and say, "Hey, you know, I had an interview here, and the interviewer asked about talk about your teamwork." I referred to the pick math program, which is true. When they go for job interviews, they can always, when an interviewer asks about, okay, hey, talk about teamwork. Okay, they can always refer to pick math. Talk about a presentation skills. They can always refer to pick math program because they have presented, they have to give a presentation uh, for 12 minutes for the, like the final presentation, which includes all the results. I'm sure we can put together a presentation for 30 to 40 minutes, but giving a 12 minute presentation, everything technical presentation is much harder than the longer presentations. The students did that through different things. And data analysis knowledge, think about it. it data is everywhere, so it is valuable for any major. And another thing is they get confidence. The student actually got lots of confidence through this program because most of the time uh, they come to me and say, hey, you know, I, I, now I know the value. I, I learned mathematics in a different way now it is, it is not so abstract. I know mathematics is applied. Now this made sense to me, this made real sense to me, some kind of things I always hear from them. And more importantly, they can work and think independently. At the same time, they can collaborate and accept other strengths and weaknesses as a team. So Jennifer, do you want to add something to it? So I would just say also on the, like, as you mentioned, the data analysis is huge, no matter what major you're in, whether you're a math major or biology, or it doesn't matter. The data analysis and the math that goes along with that, and also the computing goes hand in hand with that. So, um, I mean, ideally I would have had a programmer on every team. I didn't have that. So I had a few students who were good at Excel and files and folders, and I had some students who really didn't even know what they were doing on that. And I had a couple of students who had done a little bit of programming. Um, they all got way better from wherever they started. So um, that was huge. And, um, and so I think with this class, when I try to evaluate it, what I'm trying to compare it to as far as the rewards for the students, which is really where Vinod and I get our rewards from and seeing what it does for the students, what we have to compare it to is what, 
where they would have been without this class. So, um, so I'm comparing it to like, if, if, if they hadn't had this class, they would still not know those things. And, um, and so that's good. Um, one of my students did get accepted to a RU, my one math major, he went to a RU this summer, it ended up being virtual. Um, I wrote about pig math in my letter of recommendation, I'm pretty sure it helped. So if you decide that you are interested in the pig math program, the first thing you'll need to do is apply. Here's the timeline. So the, the applications I think are likely going to be due February or March. Watch their website. When you apply, you are going to um, need to have a letter from a dean or a comparable administrator committing your institution to offer the class. Um, one thing I mentioned earlier was that out of over 180 PIG math classes since 2014, only six have been at community colleges. When I started, there had been only two. So those of us who are doing this at community colleges are truly pioneers. So I presented it that way to my college administration, that this was an opportunity for our college to take a leadership role in showing off the amazing work that community college students can do when given the opportunity. And so, um, so if you do this, you tell that to your administration, also tell that to your students, that they're in a really select group, they're tackling problems like this, well, um, they're still in a community college, and that's something that um, not that many community colleges have done. And so that definitely appealed to them. And so when you apply, if you do happen to be at a community college, you want to for sure say that in the application. If you're at a four-year university that grants associate degrees, like, you know, you want to say that as well. Because um, those inst institutions are definitely different from your more selective institutions. Um, I don't think it's been decided this year whether the training workshop next year will be virtual or in person. It'll be in the spring, and, and um, it's been in, in person in the past, but of course, who knows right now. Um, one thing, and then in the fall, you'll recruit students, and then in this following spring, you'll teach the pick math class. Um, the summer after you teach their class, there will, so there will be a presentation opportunity for at least one of your teams. And so in the past, what happened is they went, one team from each college went to the MAA Math Fest and there was funding available for that. This year, instead, there was a virtual opportunity. And so, um, and so the students presented their, their work at a um, virtual pick math showcase, one team from each college. Uh, if you're thinking about this, I wanna also mention Please don't be intimidated by my description of how I didn't know anything about data analysis and that was all a struggle. I shared that, but I don't want to share it and have it turn you off or decide not to do it. It's a challenge, but don't, wait to, don't let that stop you. If I waited until I was a data ex science expert to do this class, I would never have offered the class. Um, the best way to learn it is by doing it, and that applies to us as well as to the students. And so um, that's kind of the timeline of what you'll have to go through. If you are interested in learning more, that this was basically what we had wanted to share. If you're interested in learning more about PIC math, you know, and I are both avail very willing to have more of an extended conversation, a question and answer type session or whatever, um, that's more than whatever few minutes we have available for questions now um, and go into more depth and we'll basically both definitely be willing to share about what we did right and what we did wrong and what we would do differently again. Um, and so if you want to stay after, then we can arrange that or of course you can contact us. You know, do you have anything else to add? Yeah, one thing I would like to say is Jennifer and I strongly believe that if we as a faculty cannot get out of our comfort zone, we cannot make our students get out of their comfort zone of doing routine problems. Think about it, after graduation, our students are gonna go to job, go, going to take on jobs, where they exactly do things similar to pick math class activities. So why not we train them right now within our, within our graduation done coursework? Thank you, that's all I wanna share, yeah. So do y'all have any questions for us? Um, anything you would like us to elaborate more on or anything like that? I just wanna read it. put them in the chat. Yeah, I just want to read a comment that uh, was posted during the, the webinar. I'm not sure that you all uh, were able to look. Uh, this is from uh, Brian Winkle. He says, just listening to both of you, I say you are heroes because of your informed risk taking, your energy, and your willingness to model for students what to do when you do not know what to do, as spoken by George Polya. 
thank you for all you've done on behalf of your students and for those of us listening to you. So I, I want to concur. Well said, Brian. Um, and well said, let's uh, give Vinod and Jennifer um, some kudos in the chat. And as I said, they're, they're welcome to answer any questions that you might have. Um, while we're doing that, let me wrap up my slides so then we can go straight to the questions um, for them. Um, so thank you for participating today. Uh, if you are not a member of AMATIC, please consider it. Uh, you'll get more information about upcoming webinars. We do have a presence on Facebook, so you can join the Facebook page. Uh, we do have conferences coming up. The Spokane uh, conference will not be in Spokane. It will be online. Uh, you should be hearing some more information about that soon. And hopefully we'll be back to our national conference on a location in Phoenix in 2021. Uh, there are more webinars and traveling workshop opportunities coming up. Um, I will try to get the uh, materials from this webinar sent out uh, later today or tomorrow. Uh, they will also be posted on AMATIC as well as previous webinars. Um, and then here is the link and the QR code for evaluating today's webinar. Um, I'm going to take this down so we can uh, see the chat easier, but I will put the link to the survey uh, in the chat as well as send it out with the materials. Um, so once again, uh, Vinod and Jennifer, thank you so much for a, a wonderful webinar today. It was very uh, inspiring. I'm going to uh, have to rethink a few things <laughs> when I get some time. I, I, I love this concept. So we did have a question uh, early on. Um, it says, at the end, please discuss ways to get your clients um, either a broad sweep or personal contacts or in between. I think you may have touched on that after the question was posted, but um, can you discuss ways to get some partnerships set up? So one thing I would do is like, as I, so, as I told, like we got to start with where we are, like within the college or university, uh, talk to the administration office, like uh, just like a foundation, every university has some foundation alumni associations where they, they want to connect with alumni. Uh, where they, they can ask for, because lots of alumni work for lots of good companies. They can provide problems. That is one way to start. And also, um, uh, like, talk to faculty. That's what I'm saying. So talk to faculties. Faculties will have connections and uh, those kind of things. That, that worked for me. That's what I would say. Yeah, and just network and ideas. And I think just getting the first class down, like I have an idea page where I write down, like I have a list of companies that I'm interested in contacting. And um, because I get picked up a good vibe from their website or because I know somebody who works there. Um, but I think now that we've done it once, it's then we can just say, hey, like our students already did this. And I feel like both of our corporate partners were, um, were glad that they did it. And, um, and so I think getting that first year under your belt is key. I really do. Um, I was very intimidated by that part. I'm not an extrovert. I'm not the sort of person that likes to go like knocking on doors. You know, when I was a kid and had to sell things for school, I totally freaked out. Um, that's not my skill set, but um, and, and you know, also, I think you can do it. And also I want to point out uh, there is lots of resources. Uh, the PICMAT directors can help uh, to give directions on how to find industrial sponsors. Hey, thank you. Uh, are there other questions, comments that anyone would like to make? I feel like you're letting them off easy today. I only had one one question, and <laughs> or, or maybe you just covered it well that they don't have anything. Any? Are there any other questions? Well, I am not seeing anything. So uh, if you do, um, when I send out the materials, their, their email contact is in the, will be in the PowerPoint. Um, I'm sure they would be happy to chat with you if you have more questions. Um, Vinod and Jennifer, thanks again. Um, and thank you all for attending. And if there are no other questions, we will wrap up this webinar. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank, thank you everyone for coming. Okay, everybody have a good day.